Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I am Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library. And as always, I am so glad that you could join me for today's reading. Uh, we are reading um, Captain Blood, a rousing pirate adventure written by Raphael Sabatini. Um, so just to briefly recap, um, Peter Blood has been branded a traitor. He has been, rather than be killed, he uh, executed. He is has been sold into slavery in Barbados on a sugar plantation and uh, owned by a foul gentleman by the name of Colonel Bishop. But his skill as a physician has earned him a slightly different job than working in the sugarcane fields, and so he uh, is plying his trade as a uh, uh, as a medical man throughout the uh, the colony and helping the governor and his wife who have numerous uh, illnesses but still despite the fact that he has a, a, admittedly an easier time um, as a slave than um, than the others of course all the other uh, uh, slaves who had gotten sent to Barbados are are working the fields and are you know, being whipped and they're being tortured and they're working really hard and it's um, he knows he's got a better a better lot than the most of the other uh, slaves there, but it still rankles him that he is a that that he he's lost his freedom that he was purchased by someone else for only ten pounds that. Um, you know, he was unfairly uh, branded a traitor, and he wants to get out. And so they've come up with this plan. Now, um, in the last couple of chapters, we read that there are two other doctors uh, in that part of the colonies, neither of whom are as good at their trade as Peter Blood. So one of them has agreed to pay whatever money is needed for a small ship and give him the opportunity to escape. Now, in order to do this, he has to partner in with several other people who uh, some have a greater amount of ship knowledge than, than he does, and he's gotten some of his uh, uh, people to, to help out with that. Um, young Jeremy Pitt is one of them. He was uh, he was a Navy man uh, before he was uh, also uh, branded a traitor and uh, sent to Barbados. And the two of them, uh, Mr. Pitt and Peter Blood, have uh, become fast friends and they sort of look out for each other. And so um, he's gotten him and he's gotten several other people, you know, approximately, uh, you know, a dozen or so uh, other men who are uh, knowledgeable in, in ship duties. And the only thing that they really need is, is someone to on the outside to go buy them a boat. So this, one of the doctors gives Peter blood the money to buy a small boat. And, um, he in turn goes, since he has freedom as a, as a physician to go in and out of the, the plantation, um, he goes to someone who was recommended to him by one of these doctors, a, uh, a Mr. Nuttall, who uh, is a debtor. and all, He's there for, for being a debtor, but he is also there to, um, well, he, he has agreed to help out Peter Blood. And so he uh, goes and uh, purchases the boat, uh, and that night they are to escape, however... The governor has an attack of the gout, and Peter Blood is sent to the, the government uh, house, and he works on him throughout the night, and of course, that foils the plan for that evening. The next day, a, uh, a police officer comes by and says, by the way, you didn't pay your fee for uh, having a boat. And you need to do that, uh, otherwise you're going to be, you know, in trouble. So Mr. Nuttall is admittedly very frightened by the whole prospect. He's trying to find Peter Blood. He's trying to make sure that everything goes according to plan. Meanwhile, 
Peter Blood has been uh, runs into uh, a young lady by the name of Arabella Bishop, the Colonel's niece, who is uh, he has told his story to. She has they've gone back and forth on on you know how they do things and why they do things. And she helps out some of the slaves, and uh, Peter Blood thinks that there's no way that she could actually be a decent human being, considering she has the same blood in her as that awful Colonel Bishop. So he thinks worse of her for it. And then this has been going on for several months now, and until finally on his way back from uh, town, he runs into her and they walk together, and he tells her the story of how he came to be enslaved. How he came to be branded a traitor and and the whole situation with the monmouth rebellion and um and she understands and she under, realizes that uh that he was perhaps unjustly um uh, accused and uh and so peter bloods and it's, it's funny because they mentioned him and he that he admits it in the story is that I mean, his head was elsewhere and that Things could have gone very differently if he hadn't spent that time with Arabella Bishop. But of course, he is somewhat, um, somewhat enamored, perhaps, of her. And and so that that's where we left it. We left it with the uh, Mister Nuttall sort of uh, uh, on the hook for the um, this boat, and he needs to figure out when people are going to actually come and sail away, so he could sail away with them and avoid the uh, upcoming problems that are going to happen as a result of all this. So, with that in mind, we now begin Chapter 7, which is enti entitled Pirates. Mr. James Nuttall made all speed, regardless of the heat, in his journey from Bridgetown to Colonel Bishop's plantation, and if ever a man was built for speed in a hot climate, that man was Mr. James Nuttall. With his short, thin body and his long, fleshless legs, so withered was he that it was hard to believe there was any juices left in him, yet juices there must have been, for he was sweating violently by the time he reached the stockade. At the entrance he almost ran into the overseer, Kent, a squat, bow-legged animal with, a, with arms of a Hercules and the jowl of a bulldog. I'm seeking uh, Captain Bl uh, Dr. Blood, he announced breathlessly. You are in rare haste, growled Kent. What the devil is it, twins? Eh? Oh, nay, nay, I I'm not married. It's a cousin of mine, sir. What is it? Uh, he's, he's taken bad, sir, Nuttall lied promptly upon the cue that Kent himself had afforded him. Is the doctor here? "'That's his hut yonder,' Kent pointed carelessly. "'If he's not there, he'll be somewhere else.' And he took himself off. He was a surly, ungracious beast at all times, readier with the lash of his whip than with, uh, than with his tongue. Nuttall watched him go with satisfaction and even noted the direction that he took. Then he plunged into the enclosure to verify in mortification that Dr. Blood was not at home. A man of sense might have sat down and waited, but Nuttall had no sense. He flung out of the stockade again, hesitated a moment as if uh, as to which direction he should take, and finally decided to go any way but the way that Kent had gone. He sped across the parched savannah towards the sugar plantation, which stood solid as a rampart and gleaming golden in the dazzling June sunshine. Avenues intersected the great blocks of ripening amber cane. In the distance down one of these he espied some slaves at work. Not all entered the avenue and advanced upon them. They eyed him dully as he passed them. Pitt was not of their number, and he dared not ask for him. He continued his search for the best part of an hour, up one of those lanes and down, then down the other. Once an overseer challenged him, demanding to know his business. He was looking, he said, for Dr. Blood. 
His cousin was taken ill. The overseer bade him go to the devil where, and get out of the plantation. Blood was not there. If he was anywhere, he would be up in his hut and in the stockade. Not all passed on. Uh, upon the undertaking, uh, I'm sorry, upon the understanding that uh, he would go. But he went in the wrong direction. He went on towards the side of the plantation farthest from the stockade, towards the dense woods that fringed it there. The overseer was too contemptuous, and perhaps too languid, in the stifling heat of approaching noontide to correct his course. Not all blundered to the end of the avenue and round the corner of it, and there ran in to Pitt, alone, toiling with a wooden spade upon an irrigation channel. A pair of cotton drawers, loose and ragged, clothed him from waist to knee. Above and below, he was naked, save for a broad hat of plaited straw <coughs> Excuse me that sheltered his unkempt golden head from the rays of the tropical sun. At sight of him, not all returned thanks aloud to his maker. Pitt stared at him, and the shipwright poured out his dismal news in a dismal tone. The sum of it was that he must have ten pounds from blood that very morning, or they were all undone, and all he got for his pains and his sweat was the condemnation of Jeremy Pitt. "'Curse you for a fool,' said the slave. "'If it's blood you're seeking, why are you wasting your time here?' Oh, "'I can't find him,' bleated Nuttall. He was indignant at his reception. He forgot the jangled state of the, other, of the other's nerves after a night of anxious wakefulness, ending in a dawn of despair. "'I, I thought that you—' You thought that I could drop my spade and go seek him for you? Is that what you thought? My God, that our lives should depend upon such a dummerhead. While you waste your time over here, the hours are passing, and if an overseer should catch you talking to me, how will you explain it? For a moment, Nuttall was bereft of speech by such ingratitude. Then he exploded. I would go to heaven. I would never have no hand in this affair. I would so. I wish that... What else he wished was never known, for at that moment round the block of Cain came a big man in a biscuit-colored in, in biscuit taffetas, followed by two negroes in cotton drawers who were armed with cutlasses. He was not ten yards away, but his approach over the soft yielding moral had been unheard. Mr. Nuttall looked wildly this way and that a moment, then bolted like a rabbit for the woods, thus doing the most foolish and betraying thing that in circumstances it was possible for him to do. Pitt groaned and stood still, leaning upon his spade. "'Hey there! Stop!' bawled Colonel Bishop after the fugitive, and added horrible threats, tricked out with some rhetorical indecencies. But the fugitive held a mane, and never so much as turned his head. It was his only remaining hope that Colonel Bishop might not have seen his face, for the power and influence of Colonel Bishop was quite sufficient to hang any man whom he thought would be better dead. Not until the runagate had vanished into the scrub did the planter sufficiently recover from his indignant amazement to remember the two negroes who were followed at his heels like a brace of hounds. It was a bodyguard without which he had never moved upon his plantations since a slave had made an attack upon him and all but strangled him a couple of years ago. "'After him, you black swine!' he roared at them. But as they started, he checked them. "'Wait! Get to heel, blast you!' It occurred to him that to catch and deal with the fellow there was not the need to go after him, and perhaps spend the day hunting him in that cursed wood. There was Pitt here ready to his hand, and Pitt should tell him the identity of his bashful friend, and also the subject of that close and secret talk he had disturbed. 
Pitt might, of course, be reluctant. So much the worse for Pitt. The ingenious Colonel Bishop knew a dozen ways, some of them quite diverting, of conquering stubbornness in these convict dogs. He turned now upon the slave, a countenance that was inflamed by heat internal and external, and a pair of beady eyes that were alight with cruel intelligence. He stopped uh, forward, swinging his light bamboo cane. Who was that renegade? He asked with terrible suavidity. Leaning over on his spade, Jeremy Pitt hung his head a little and shifted uncomfortably on his bare feet. Vainly he groped for an answer in a mind that would do nothing but curse the idiocy of Mr. James Nuttall. The planter's bamboo cane fell on the lad's naked shoulders with a stinging force. Answer me, you dog! What's his name? Jeremy looked at the burly planter out of sullen, almost defiant eyes. I don't know, he said, and in his voice there was a faint note, at least of the defiance aroused in him by a blow which he dared not, for his life's sake, return. His body had remained unyielding under it, but the spirit within writhed now in torment. You don't know? Well, here's to quicken your wits. And again the cane descended. Have you no thought of his name yet? I have not. Stubborn, eh? For a moment the colonel leered, and then his passion mastered him. Sounds, you impudent dog! Do you trifle with me? Do you think I'm to be mocked? Pitt shrugged, shifted sideways on his feet again, and settled into dogged silence. Few things are more provocative, and Colonel Bishop's temper was never one that required much provocation. Brute for fury now awoken him fiercely, now he lashed those defenseless defenseless shoulders, accompanying each blow by blasphemy and foul abuse, until stung beyond endurance the lingering embers of his manhood fanned into a momentary flame, Pitt sprang upon his tormentor. But as he sprang, he also sprang the so also sprang the watchful blacks, muscular bronze arms coiled crushingly about the frail white body, and in a moment the unfortunate slave stood powerless, his wrists pinioned behind him in a leathern thong. Breathing hard, his face mottled. Bishop uh, pondered him a moment, then, Fetch him along, he said. Down the long avenue, between those golden walls of cane, standing some eight feet high, the wretched pit was thrust by his black captors in the colonel's wake, stared at with fearful eyes by the fellow slaves at work there. Despair went with him. What torments might immediately await him, he cared little, horrible though he knew they would be. The real source of his mental anguish lay in the conviction that the elaborately planned escape from the unutterable hell was frustrated now in the very moment of execution. They came out upon the green plateau and headed for the stockade and the, the overseer's white house. Pitt's eyes looked out over Carlisle Bay, of which this plateau commended a clear view from the fort on one side and to the long sheds of the wharf on the other. Along this wharf, a few shallow boats were moored, and Pitt caught himself wondering which of these was the wherry in which, the, with a little luck, they might have been at, now at sea. But over the sea his glance ranged miserably. In the roads, standing in for the shore before the gentle breeze that scarcely ruffled the sapphire surface of the Caribbean, came a stately, red-hulled frigate, flying the English ensign. Colonel Bishop halted to consider her, shading his eyes with a, his fleshly hand. Light as was the breeze, the vessel spread no canvas to it beyond that of her foresail. Furled was her every other sail, leaving a clear view of the majestic lines of her hull, 
from towering Stern Castle to gilded Beakhead that was a flash in the dazzling sunshine. So leisurely in advance argued a master, indifferently acquainted with these waters, who preferred to creep forward cautiously, sounding his way. At her present rate of progress, it would be an hour, perhaps, before she came to anchorage within the harbor, and whilst the colonel viewed her, admiring, perhaps, the gracious beauty of her, Pitt was hurried forward into the stockade and clapped into the stocks that stood there ready for slaves who required correction. Colonel Bishop followed him presently with le leisurely rolling gait. A mutinous cur that shows his fangs to his master must learn good manners at the cost of a striped hide, was all he said before setting about his executioner's job. That with his own hands he should do that which most men of his station would, out of self-respect, have relegated to one of the Negroes, but get, uh, gives you the measure of the man's beastliness. It was almost as if with relish, as if gratifying some feral instinct of cruelty, that he now lashed his victim about the head and shoulders. Soon his cane was reduced to splinters by his violence. You know, perhaps the sting of a flexible bamboo cane when it is whole. But do you realize its murderous quality when it has been split into several long, lithe blades, each with an edge that is of the keenness of a knife? When at last, from very weariness, Colonel Bishop flung away the stump and thongs to which he, his cane had been reduced, the wretched slave's back was bleeding pulp from neck to waist. As long as full sensibility remained, Jeremy Pitt had made no sound. But in a measure, as from pain, his senses were mercifully dulled. He sank forward in the stocks and hung there now in a huddled heap, faintly moaning. Colonel Bishop set his foot upon the crossbar, and leaned over his victim a cruel smile on his full, coarse face. "'Let that teach you a proper submission,' said he. "'And now, touching that shy friend of yours, "'you shall stay here without meat or drink. "'Without meat or drink, do you hear me? "'Until you please to tell me his name and business.' "'He took his foot from the bar.' When you had enough of this, send me a word, and we'll have the branding irons to you. On that he swung on his heel and strode out of the stockade, his negroes following him. Pitt had heard him, as we hear things in our dreams. At the moment, so spent was he by his cruel punishment, and so deep was the despair into which he had fallen, that he no longer cared whether he lived or died. Soon, however, from the partial stupor which pain had mercifully induced, a new variety of pain aroused him. The stocks stood in the open under the full glare of the tropical sun, and its burning rays streamed down upon the mangled, bleeding back until he felt as if flames of fire were searing it. And soon to this was added a torment still more unspeakable. Flies. The cruel flies of the Antilles, drawn by the scent of blood, descended in a cloud upon him. Small wonder that the ingenious Colonel Bishop, who so well understood the art of loosening stubborn tongues, had not deemed it necessary to have recourse to other means of torture. Not all his fiendish cruelty could devise a torment more cruel, more unendurable, than the torments nature would here procure a man in Pitt's condition. The slave writhed in his stocks until he was in danger of breaking his limbs, and writhing screamed in agony. Thus he was, was he found by Peter Blood, who seemed to his troubled vision to materialize suddenly before him. Mr. Blood carried a large palmetto leaf, having whisked away 
with this the flies that were devouring Jeremy's back. He slung it by a strip of fiber from the lad's neck so that it protected him for, from further attacks as well as from the rays of the sun. Next, sitting down beside him, he drew the sufferer's head down to his own shoulder and bathed his face from a pannikin of cold water. Pitt shuddered and moaned on a long, indrawn breath. Drink, he gasped, drink for the love of heaven. The pannikin was held to his quivering lips. He drank greedily, noisily, nor ceased until he had drained the vessel. Cooled and relieved by the draft, he attempted to sit up. My back, he screamed. There was an unusual glint in Mr. Blood's eyes. His lips were compressed. But when he parted them to speak, his voice came cool and steady. Be easy now, one thing at a time. Your back's taking no harm at all for the present, since I've ordered, since I've covered it up. I'm wanting to know what happened to you. Do you think we can do without a navigator that ye go and provoke that beast bishop until he all but kills you? Pitt sat up and groaned again, but this time his anguish was mental rather than physical. I don't think a navigator will be needed this time, Peter. What's that? cried Mr. Blood. Pitt explained the situation as briefly as he could in a halting, gasping speech. I am to rot here until I tell them the identity of my visitor and his business. Mr. Blood got up, growling in his throat. Bad cess to, filthy, to the filthy slaver, said he. But it must be contrived, nevertheless. To the devil with nut all. Whether he gives surety for the boat or not, whether he explains it or not, the boat remains, and we're going, and you're coming with us. You're dreaming, Peter, said the prisoner. We're not going this time. The magistrates will confiscate the boat, since the surety's not paid, even if, when they press him, Nuttall does not confess the whole plan and get us all branded on the forehead. Mr. Blood turned away and, with agony in his eyes, looked out to sea over the blue water by which he had so fondly hoped soon to be traveling back to freedom. The great red ship had drawn considerably nearer shore by now. Slowly, majestically, he was entering, she was entering the bay. Already one or two wherries were putting off from the wharf to board her. From where he stood, Mr. Blood could see the glinting of the brass cannons mounted on the prow above the curving beakhead, and he could make out the figure of a seaman in the forechains of her uh, larboard side, aside, leaning out to heave the lead. An angry voice aroused him from his unhappy thoughts. What the devil are you doing here? The returning Colonel Bishop came striding into the stockade, his negroes following at ever. Mr. Blood turned to face him, and over that swarthy countenance, which, indeed, by now was tanned to the golden brown of a half-caste Indian, a mask descended. Doing, he said blandly, why, the duties of my office. The Colonel, striding furiously forward, observed two things. The empty pannikin on the seat beside the prisoner, and the palmetto leaf pr protecting his back. Have you dared to do this? The veins on the planter's forehead stood out like cords. Of course I have. Mr. Blood's tone was one of faint surprise. I said he was to have neither meat nor drink till I ordered it. Sure, now I never heard you. You never heard me? How could you have heard me when you weren't here? Then how do you expect me to know what orders you'd given? Mr. Blood's tone was positively aggrieved. All that I knew was that one of your slaves was being murdered by the sun and flies, and I says to myself, this is one of the colonel's slaves, and I'm the colonel's doctor, 
and sure it's my duty to be looking after the colonel's property. So I just gave the fellow a spoonful of water and covered his back from the sun. And wasn't I right now? Right? The colonel was almost speechless. Be easy now, be easy, Mr. Blood impl implored him. It's an apoplexy you'll be contracting if you give way to heat like this. The planter thrust him aside with, imp with an imprecation and stepping forward tore the palmetto leaf from the prisoner's back. In the name of humanity now, Mr. Blood was beginning. The colonel swung upon him furiously. Out of this, he commanded. And don't come near him again till I send for you, unless you want to be served in the same way. He was a terrific. He was terrific in his menace, in his bulk, and in the power of him. But Mister Blood never flinched. It came to the Colonel, as he found himself steadily regarded by those light blue eyes, that looked so arrestingly odd in that tawny face like pale sapphires set in copper, that this rogue had for some time now been growing presumptuous. It was a matter that he must presently correct. Meanwhile, Mr. Blood was speaking again, his tone quietly insistent. In the name of humanity, he repeated, you let me do, you let me to do what I can to ease his sufferings, or I swear to you that I'll forsake at once the duties of a doctor, and that it's, uh, it's devil another patient I will attend in this unhealthy island at all. For an instant, the colonel was too amazed to speak. Then, by God, he roared. Do you dare take that tone with me, you dog? Do you dare to make terms with me? I do that. The unflinching blue eyes looked squarely into the colonel's, and there was a devil peeping out of them, the devil of recklessness that is born of despair. Colonel Bishop considered him for a long moment in silence. I've been too soft with you, he said at last. But that's to be mended and he tightened his lips. I'll have the rods to you until there's not an inch of skin left on your dirty back. Will you so? And what would, the, what would Governor Steed do then? You're not the only doctor on the island. Mr. Blood actually laughed. And will you tell that to His Excellency? him with the gout on his, in his foot so bad that he can't stand. You know very well it's devil another doctor will, will he tolerate, being an intelligent man, he knows what's good for him. But the colonel's brute passion, thoroughly aroused, was not easily to be balked. If you're alive when my blacks have done with you, perhaps you'll come to your senses. He swung to his negroes to issue an order, but it was never issued. At that moment, a terrific rolling thunderclap drowned his voice and shook the very air. Colonel Bishop jumped, his negroes jumped with him, and so even did the apparently imperturbable Mr. Blood. Then the four of them stared together seawards. Down in the bay, all that could be seen of the great ship standing now within a cable's length of the fort were her top masts thrusting above a cloud of smoke in which she was enveloped. From the cliffs, a flight of startled seabirds had risen to circle in the blue, giving tongue to their alarm at the plaintive curlew noisiest of all. As those men stared from the eminence on which they stood, not yet understanding what had taken place. They saw the British Jack dip from the main trunk and vanish into the rising cloud below. A moment more, and up through that cloud to replace the flag of England, so soared the gold and crimson banner of Castile. And then they understood. Pirates! roared the colonel, and again, Pirates! 
fear and incredulity were blent in his uh, voice, and he paled under the, his tan until his face was the color of clay, and there was a wild fury in his beady eyes. We'll end it there. And that is, more or less, the conclusion of Chapter 7, Pirates. And so, my goodness, thus we end on another cliffhanger. What's going to happen to Peter Blood? Pirates have now arrived. Uh, timely fashion, I guess, for him, since he was about to be whipped. And, uh, my goodness, what will happen next? Well, you can find out if you join me at uh, Wednesday at 4 p.m. as we read Chapter 8 of Captain Blood, and we'll find out what happens and what will be the result uh, of our of our friends and, uh, and even the enemies, I guess, we'll find out. Um, so I hope you can join me in two days on Wednesday at 4 p.m., and we'll read another chapter. And uh, thank you very much for uh, being here for this one, and we'll see you again. Bye, everyone.